Now we go to some interpretation, which is based both on the Radialarian record from uh, uh, site uh, 765 in the Argo Basin, but also on all available published uh, Radialarian occurrences around uh, Antarctica in, in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, there are several sites, as you will see, where we find the same Radialarians. We don't have complete sequences, but we have some samples. And so this allows to, to really sketch uh, an area where we have these austral radiolarians. Uh, the other uh, uh, base of this interpretation is the uh, uh, plate tectonic reconstruction done by Christian Vera. Uh, he has used a, a uh, model that is uh, a successor model of the Stampfli uh, model, essentially. And, uh, but he has recalculated all the positions of the, uh, of the plates and the, and the ma magnetic delineations and so on. So uh, these are the two bases of, uh, of, this, uh, of this interpretation. So we go uh, through different points. You can see them there. We first want to look where are the rats, what is a, a neotitian versus a subtropical gyre and austral radiolarians, what is it, what, what are they? And then we will see how they got into the Argo Basin and from somewhere around Antarctica. And then uh, we will look at the relationship between plate tectonics and uh, these radiolarian occurrences, and we come finally to the climate change, which I think uh, the, 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 the passage from Jurassic to Cretaceous was triggered by Pangaea breakup and by a paleo-oceanographic and paleoclimatic reorganization of mainly Tethys and Pantalassa. Okay, so first two slides to show you that nothing happened, major, no major catastrophe like in other uh, uh, boundaries, happens at the Jurassic Cretaceous transition. I don't call it boundary, it's a transition. And the, the definition has been revised, but it's not placed at some natural break in the uh, record. You can see that the, the isotopes, the carbon isotopes, decline like this. There is no major uh, uh, oceanic plateau or, or, or uh, trap or anything. The major traps are down here in the Liassic and up there in the Cretaceous. During this period, there's nothing major. That's one point. If we zoom in, though, there is an important diff, uh, change in many pelagic sequences of, of tethys, of, of, of the western tethys at least. You go from red to gray, and you go from very siliceous rocks into mainly pelagic limestones. We have some turnover in radiolarians at this time, quite important turnover, but this turnover is not confirmed in Santalasa, for instance. The, the uh, um, oxygen isotopes uh, show a wiggling here that has been not interpreted as temperature change, but as a change in the hydrologic cycle, which is called the Titonian dry event. But it straddles the Titonian variation transition. And this dry event will be one of the elements that we use to interpret uh, the whole uh, situation and the uh, change. And here, uh, I have put the sea level curve from Hack uh, 2014, and you can, you can see that there's some major short-term regressions during the late Titonian and during the early Bariasian, which could indicate that there is uh, some uh, mountain ice on Antarctica, Australia, that, that we will see later. OK. So just again, this, you, have, you have seen this figure. We are here in the Arco Basin in special uh, magnetic anomalies uh, that do not correspond to the opening of the Indian Ocean. And most people thought that there was here a landmass originally, 
which has moved away. And there were two openings. There was an opening in the Argo Basin, and then there was finally the opening of the uh, uh, true Indian Ocean. Now, this piece that is lacking here is supposed to be in the Himalayas. But uh, we, I don't think we have found it. Uh, and there are several hypotheses. It could also be uh, far, more, much farther east uh, in Southeast uh, Asia, according to Stamfli, for instance. OK, now we are looking at sites not only in the Argo Basin, but also in the Antarctic Peninsula, in Patagonia. Uh, there are some sites here that are now farther north, but uh, in the Cretaceous they were uh, at high latitude. Uh, and uh, so we have def definitely several sites around here, uh, especially on the other side, on the opposite side of, of uh, Antarctica, Australia, in the Cretaceous, with respect to the Arco Basin. So how did they get around this? That is the main question. OK, uh, so you all know Tessian radiolarians. I don't have to talk about this. I just sticked in an old plate uh, of mine. Uh, there are many, many genera which are really typical Tessian, Tessian like Perifusus, uh, many large uh, uh, Hagia streets, and so on and so on. Now, the, what I call the crypto archaeo assemblage is a very low diversity assemblage of small nasalarians, essentially crypto thoracic and crypto cephalic nasalarians, and small archaeodic dimetra. And it was Bonnie Marchi in the 70s that first uh, discovered this assemblage and interpreted it actually as coming out of the central gyre of Pantarasa. Now, we have the luck that in the clay, in the clay stones of our site, we have this fauna. And we have no, but of course, these exist in Tethian in zones. But here, they are totally dominant. They make, together, they make 99% of the assemblage. So they're much more abundant than in Tethian uh, sections. So that would be a, a short characterization of this uh, uh, crypto archaeo assemblage that I would put back into subtropical gyre, gyres. These, these uh, species are, I think, they are probably tolerant to low, to low fertility, uh, or they are more or less specialized. Uh, uh, that's, that is the thing we don't know. OK, now look, just one more look at Austral Radelarians. There are many endemic species, uh, new uh, families and new genera. And uh, I've been talking about the characteristic. You have the carbos, which you can see in many different groups. So it's certainly not something sp uh, specific. To, it's not a specific character, this carbos. I think it's a kind of a, could be an infection or a parasite that sits on the radiolarian and, and impedes the secondary thickness growth. And that's why in the carbos you have a very delicate skeleton key is left, but you, do, you don't have the outer layer of the skeleton. OK, now let's look at the distribution in some key section. You have here one key section, which is uh, um, <coughs> the, in the Antarctic Peninsula, published by Kisling. It's the, probably, probably the only quanti taxon quantitative work right now in the Oswald Rand. Surprisingly, he states that really Austral Radiolarians only start more or less around the, the Teutonian periacid boundary. Before that, he has mainly a fauna that he correlates with Mesalius northern boreal or, or, or yeah, southern boreal realm. Now, I think what has been called northern and southern boreal uh, realm is nothing else but radiolarian assemblages of the west of the west uh, of the eastern boundary curves. 
So I call this Eastern Boundary Current Assemblage. And uh, I think in Bragin and Bragina, you have seen that he calls this uh, East Equatorial Realm, but it's not equatorial. It ranges from plus or minus uh, 40 to 50 degrees north and south into the equator. So it is absolutely not characteristic of a, a distinct paleolatitude. It has a very long range. What you have to notice also is that all the faunas are mixed. So you would have here uh, where Eastern Boundary Current, you would have the encryptio archaeo that you have always in there, and here essentially Eastern Boundary Current rats are replaced by by uh, um, by Austral rats. In our site, you have only uh, crypto archaeo and Austral. And only up here, uh, somewhere in the, in the late Bangin, you start to have Tehian, which increased progressively. Uh, this is just uh, Vindalia, which is on, on land. You have almost uh, no, you have little Tehian material. You don't have the crypto archaeo, but you have a lot of Austro. And finally, here in in, in Western Timor, in the Naku Funo uh, formation, which has been studied by Munazri and by Globes independently, uh, what we find is that you have very few Austria. They are there, and at the same time as they increase, the Tethian ones increase here, somewhere in, in, uh, in the Paramia, you get also much more uh, Tethian. Uh, Tethian radiolarians in, in that section. And, and so the Tethian here, mm. dark red, they dominate completely in the upper part. And of course, they are crypto -archaeal. So we can see from this record that uh, the, the Nakuno site was further north in video latitude. And uh, David Haig thinks that it was simply a prolongation of the northwestern uh, Australian margin that crashed into the Bandar Arc and was accreted there. So we are essentially looking at a parallel from, from these sections here up to, to these sections over here. So this gives us a geometry that we can interpret it in terms of uh, ocean currents. I will show you that in more detail later. OK, now what is the plate tectonics? Here I show you a, an animation of uh, does it work? Yeah, this is Scotty's uh, very classical animation. And what you can see, uh, if we go to 140, which is more or less the. Uh, yeah, well, what you can see is that. Uh, can we go back? Yeah, we can. Unfortunately, it's very quick. Ooh. Yeah. No. It doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Let me see if I click here. No. There is, there is a, a, a feature that you have really an opening. Uh, come on. You want to have it work again? No. Uh, I, I, yeah. Here I am. But no, wait, I uh, will go more back. No, no, that's fine. N now you should launch it. Okay. Yeah, okay. So you can see that around 130, you have an opening uh, between Africa, India, and finally uh, Australia. Uh, the problem is here that this is based on, on all paleomagnetic data. There are new papers out in the between nine, uh, 2010 and 2020 that show older lineations also between uh, India and Australia. So this means that there was a passage that opened early, and we now think, with all the data we have, that there was an oceanic waterway between connecting the Southern Ocean between uh, India and Australia, and that's where the, uh, 
the, the, the austral radiolarians reached the Argo Basin. Uh, well, I have, I'm not the only to hypothesize this. You can see this is Gordon, 1970. He drew a, a current that goes here between, between uh, India and Antarctica. There is a current, and he was based on ammonite bubbles. So the ammonites show that some water had to come through here because you find the, the same ammonites on both sides of, of the southern pole. Okay, then uh, this was my drawing in, in 92. Uh, it is drawn in the low Cretaceous, not at the limit Jurassic Cretaceous. Uh, and there, uh, the, this seaway is wide open already, and you get uh, these radiolarians around the southern continent of the time, and they come in here. And uh, this is 93. Uh, of course, we had a different uh, initial fit here, but I think uh, this, this is the right fit. This is the fit that is still used today. And there was certainly rifting since the late Jurassic, and probably opening in the earliest Cretaceous. Okay, this is uh, uh, Munazri and Sashida who did this drawing uh, quite recently. They also bring these rods in here, and of course they bring also Tekian rods via the uh, the the gyre via the subtropical gyre. They bring in Tekian rods into the Timor sections which are located up here. So we agree, we agree about this passage. It's the only way because you have to go this way around uh, the Antarctic uh, uh, continent of the time. You cannot go the other way. And what has to be said that is that seaway is parallel to, to uh, longitude. So there's no coriolis for it. So you can push a current through here by winds that go around the, uh, the, uh, the southern continent. OK, so with that data, with that interpretation in the first place, we go and see uh, what happens here at that time. And Hay was making this drawing and was saying there is probably mountain ice, upland ice, ice sheets, but transient ice sheets uh, in, in this uh, Antarctic continent, along these seaways, you need humidity and the cold weather. Uh, when this was, when Pangea was totally closed, it was too dry. You don't get ice. You only get ice if you have the humidity. Where does it come from? It comes from Texas, from near Texas. And, and so this explains also the sea level, the sharp sea level, several drops we, are, we have here. They could be paid, they could be placed your to use that thing. Okay, now let's look uh, once again on this uh, picture. Don't we, we would have, we are here at 140, which is more or less the, the earliest uh, Cretaceous, and you have, you must have a current that goes around it because you have these radiolarians in all these stars here. These are sites where you have these uh, austral radiolarians which are upstream from the Argo Basin, then they have to go through here, probably a still non-oceanic um, passage, but deeply rifted, and then they appear here, and they appear in, the, in Western Timor, and they appear in the Tekian Himalayas. They appear in, 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 in many rocks, have been published on many rocks, well, they have been, some of them have been interpreted as late Cretaceous, but it's clearly early Cretaceous, Austral fauna mixed with Tethian fauna in the Himalayas, in, the, in southern Tibet, in what, what is considered to be the northern margin of Greater India. And this northern margin at this time was just opposed to the Argo Basin. So this is very logical. You find the same rods up here. Then you have a subtropical gyre, you have it here, you have it here, uh, and it brings in a radiolarium from Tethys. 
but it has its own fauna, which is characterized by this very impoverished uh, uh, crypto archaeo assemblage. So that is about the model. Now, something I've not talked yet about, you see this seaway here, we'll see it in, a, in, a, in, a, in another projection much better. This is the Rocas Verdes Basin, which is a back arc basin behind the principal arc of the Pacific uh, subduction zone that goes all along the Americas. This basin has been studied since the 1970s because it was, uh, it was uh, source prone for, for petroleum. And of course, the, uh, the Lake Queen Basin, which is adjacent to that opening, is a big uh, area of uh, oil exploration and exploitation. And in this area, you find all Tethian microsources of the Titonian and the Periathian. Calperides, Nanoconides, Tethian Ardillarians, uh, uh, Sacrochoma, and so on. All the typical faces, uh, fossils of the Tethian realm, you find here in South, South America. How did they come there? Most authors take them through Pantalaza and back into the Neoclean Basin. To me, this is impossible because these are oligotrophic forms and they cannot go through the upwelling of the, the eastern Pantalaza. So they are blocked and even the currents, the, the boundary currents go northwards along South America and they went like that since probably the Triassic. And so they cannot swim against that current. So there must be another way to, give, to bring these Tethian forms down there to, to southern uh, South America. And the only way is to, to count on that back of basin, which has a, probably a monsoonal circulation going back and forth and connecting with the Proto-Caribbean basin and with the early Atlantic and finally with the Western Tethys. Okay, uh, so this is a drawing I first published in uh, 2013, where I put the, tropic, the, the tropical convergence zones. And you, what you can see here is that the big landmass, here we are in Little Jurassic, the big landmass of uh, Gondwana, it makes that it heats up very much, and so this tropical convergence is very much to the south, uh, uh, in, in, in northern summer, or, uh, no, sorry, northern winter or southern summer, okay? And it goes up, like today, very much north. So this makes a huge area where we have opposed monsoon winds, or opposed straight winds because of Coriolis force, and that's where we have all this high fertility of the Neotetis. So, of course, this has been uh, stated by Uriya, by Ikeda, and other people who have modeled this uh, more precisely. Okay, obviously it's based on what we know today. You can see that over the continents, this southern convergence zone, inner-tropical convergence zone, goes very much uh, south because this continent heats up during summer and during southern summer, and so this, uh, this makes this... Uh, this uh, big difference in the passage of this convergence and with opposed winds uh, on, on the Indian Ocean, for instance. So this was the model to, to create this. Now, uh, okay, uh, there is a slide missing here. What's going on? I want to go... Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can see it for a second, but no matter. I wanted to show you the real model. This is an oversimplification of the model from Vera, but you can see on the real model, it, it, it goes away in a tenth of a second. Uh, the real model shows all the time points. It shows all the, the tectonic elements. It shows natural and synthetic and magnetic lineations in the oceans. You know that from Palomza, we know that from Palomza, we, we know nothing. So you can do what you want with Palomza. You have to invent some, some, some plates 
uh, of which you find remnants all around Tantalasa, you find remnants in all your heights. But you don't know where they were exactly. We may be able to find out with red line where they were. Pay your back works for some places, but it only gives you longitude, latitude, uh, latitude, sorry. Longitude is very difficult. So, but this is the simplified model we start out with. And here we are in the late Jurassic. You can see that Gondwana is still intact. Well, Pantharas are still more or less intact, except for the uh, early Atlantic and the Proto-Cariban, which opened since, well, the Proto-Cariban opened since the Oxfordian, the Central Atlantic, since probably early Middle Jurassic. So nothing happens, and you have these jaws here, and this, this, this uh, big greenhouse here, this mega monsoon situation in Neotetis. OK, so that is the same you've seen. Here I added a, a hypothetical uh, uh, wind system around the pole, but this is just, you know, this is just a fiction. Now, if, ah, here is the, here is the model. Here's the model for 140, which is the earliest Cretaceous. You can see that we significantly opened uh, uh, Gondwana, uh, yeah, Gondwana, or this, this, this Pangaea breakup. You have these huge backyard basins, which are documented by Ophiolites all along. But obviously, uh, in the Andes, <coughs> they, they sometimes are highly metamorphic, have no fossils, but they are there. And that's where the Tethian. Uh, beasties come in and get into the near Queen Basin here. And that's where we're going to have this current going around the pole, bringing uh, 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 Australadians into the, into the Arco Basin from around here. I think they originated somewhere on the other side of the southern continent. Okay, now what happens to the curves? When you open here, uh, you, took, you take off the lid of, of, of the casserole of Neotetis. This is a scale for, for heat, oceanic heat stored in the water that goes southwards. With it goes humidity, and so you cool down the whole tropical depth. And this is probably the Titonium Bergazi dry event. It has profound effects on Western Tethys, especially here. We close the Radiolarite window. We go from Radiolarite to Pelagic Limestone that some of us have seen yesterday in the field. The Biancone is a less fertile, it's a more oligotrophic sediment as compared to Radiolarites. So this happens. And what happens also is that you finally here have a place for a central gyre, which before didn't work because you had the mega monsoon. Now you have the space. And that is the source of these crypto archaeo assemblages in Claystone of the Argo Basin. OK. Here you have the comparison of the two things. You see that the southern convergence here, it moves much to the north because here, you don't heat up as much because you have sea waste within Gondwana. That's very important. So that is, that is essentially one explanation. And it could explain, actually, uh, the passage from Jurassic to Cretaceous, uh, which is very gradual, but is distinct, at least in some places of the world. In Neotetis, not much happens. You get rid of the right all the way through. Starting in Turkey, you have complete sequences from uh, the lower Jurassic to the late, to the late Cretaceous. So, uh, in, only in sensitive areas within Pangaea where you have big changes. Okay, well, that is uh, just again uh, the view of this uh, data. Here are the conclusions. So, we think clearly that the, 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 the faunas we find. In this austral realm, is, is a consequence of plate tectonic opening, rapid uh, opening and dissection of the Gondwana close to the Jurassic uh, Cretaceous boundary. It's not 
as, as taught by many people in the Valangini. It's earlier, it must be earlier, based on all the data, not the, especially fossil data we have from the Antarctic Peninsula, from Patagonia, and so on. And, and, and then, of course, this triggers probably mountain ice in the, in the southern continent, which would be evidenced by sharp <coughs> sea level drops. This is repetitively, there, is a, there are cycles in there that we don't really understand, but it would explain that, and it would also explain the, 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 the climatic gradient, which is dramatic being between uh, Argo and Western Timor today. Well, that's about it. Okay. Come on.